Amen. Would you stand and welcome to worship at Black Rock Church this morning? It's so great to be with you. It's a fall morning. It smells like uh, leaves coming down outside. And it's so great to be together to worship our God this morning. Would you join us as we sing now, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery.
And please be seated. Good morning, my name is Melissa and I wanna welcome everyone joining us this morning. We are so thrilled that you're here with us. And if you're new to our church, it could seem like a really big place, but we wanna help you find meaningful connection with others and get plugged in here. So come visit us at the guest reception after service. We would love to meet you. And if you are online, just head over to blackrock.org info and fill out our connect form so that we can reach out to you. Well, coming up next month is Baptism Sunday and the Bible is clear that followers of Jesus should declare their relationship to him through the symbol of baptism. Baptism represents Jesus's death, burial and resurrection. And if you're an adult who has never been baptized as a Christ follower, you should sign up today to take that step of wholehearted devotion to Jesus at our November 20th baptism services. Now, if you're a student in grades six through 12, you can learn a little bit more about this from your student ministry team leaders, or just let us know that you're interested by filling out the student interest form on our website. Sign up forms and more information can be found at blackrock.org info. And we also invite you to visit the booth in the Welcome Center to ask any questions you could have uh, considering taking this big step. Next to tell you about are a few ways that you can partner up with others here at Black Rock to bless those around us this month and next. So to start off, it is that time of year again where we're distributing hundreds of Thanksgiving meals to those in need. It's our yearly Thanksgiving blessings bags and we're asking you to fill a blessing bag with the items for a holiday meal that will be distributed to Black Rock families and families served by our local ministries. You'll have two easy options again this year and it all kicks off next week. However, there's something really important that we would love for you to do starting today, and that's to submit a deserving family's name who will receive that blessing bag. We know there are a lot of families in the church who are in need, but we're not going to know about all of them unless you tell us. So submit a deserving family's name, even if that person is part of your own family. Something new we're doing this year is if you are a part of Black Rock and have a relative who doesn't attend here, but who is in need and would be blessed by one of these bags, submit their name as well. Our goal this year is to give out 1,000 blessing bags, and we've come close to that, but not quite. We've hit 886, actually, so let's beat that this year. Please be a part of reaching this goal by taking a moment to submit a deserving family's name and then participate in filling a bag. Visit blackrock.org info to submit the names and to learn a little bit more. Let's join together so we can bless people this Thanksgiving. Another way to start blessing others now is through our fifth Sunday donations. God is inviting us to be a part of providing for the physical needs of our neighbors and local partners. This month, we're gonna be collecting clothes, food, as well as laundry supply donations for Pivot Ministries. That's happening October 30th. And you can find a detailed list of the needs at the booth in the Welcome Center or go online to blackrock.org info. You could bring those items into church with you on October 30th and it'll be distributed to pivot. We are still in our Four Generations to Come campaign. So if you haven't yet, fill out the pledge card inside your brochure and then place it in the offering box. You could submit and fulfill your pledge as well as give tithes and offerings in the offering box or online. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3:20 to 21. Let's join together in prayer. Oh, great God, we turn our thoughts, our worship to you. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have to live in New England. And uh, Lord, to see the display of your creativity and your beauty in the autumn leaves. Lord, thank you for the way these colorful leaves uh, are illuminated by sunlight, by your light, and then uh, in, the, in the wind, there's this, this uh, celebration, like a ticker tape parade of, of just color coming down. Lord, we thank you for your creativity. You did not have to bless us with this kind of beauty, but you did. And we just are, we stand in awe of your care, your creativity, your goodness that's displayed everywhere around us. Thank you for displaying that both in your created 
uh, world, but also thank you for displaying it in your people. Lord, thank you for the joy we have to bless each other in your name. And Lord, would you just continue to uh, make uh, Black Rock a place of blessing where you're, are, you're not only blessing your people uh, who follow you, Jesus, but that you're also sending us out because that's your heart, that's your mission to go out and to bless others with uh, the love that you've given to us in very practical ways, but also uh, with that message of salvation in your name. God, thank you for being with us in times of, uh, of joy and in times of need and even sorrow. Lord, we pray for uh, the family of Phyllis Rogers in uh, her home going. Lord, we're just praying for this family that you give them comfort and peace. Uh, and Lord, I also just uh, seek that for all here today who are grieving someone, who are missing someone, who sense loss in their lives. Lord, would you fill uh, that empty spot with your presence, your love, your care. And Lord, we also lift up uh, Ken Steve Sr., uh, who is in the hospital receiving treatment. Lord, would you heal his body? Would you restore him to, uh, to health? Lord, thank you for his uh, desire to serve you and to love people around him. Lord, even use him in the hospital uh, to uh, be a, a messenger of peace and joy. Lord, we also uh, thank you for uh, just your uh, word and ministry in this place. Lord, we pray that you would even use the, um, the opening of your word as we uh, study your word together today. Lord, would you give us a whole new sense of your purpose for us in whatever we do uh, for your glory, Jesus. Lord, we give to you uh, the overflow of what you've given to us uh, you've given us so much. And now in that um, responsibility of, of giving back and worship to you, we give our offering, uh, whether it be here in this room or uh, if we're on online, to give online to your glory, Jesus, to your work in this world. We praise you together in your name. Amen. Would you receive now these words from Psalm 42? As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart how I walked with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. I am deeply depressed Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by day and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones while all day long they say to me, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God. For I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. We hear the emotion and the anguish in these words, asking that question we've all asked at one point or another, why? Why is this happening? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I so discouraged? 
And if that's you this morning, or if that was you last week, or if it's not you right now, you can rest assured it will be you one day. We have to take those words that come after the why, which say, put your hope in God. Because whatever our lot, whatever God has allowed into our path, we can say together, it is well with my soul when we have put our hope in him. So would you stand and let's do that now together.
It is well. It is well with our souls. Um, I'd like to uh, tell you about a hospital, large city hospital, with a mystery. Uh, This is a specialty hospital, which means that all four floors of this facility are treating the same kind of patients with the same kind of illnesses. Uh, But one of the four floors has uh, patients having a better outcome. Uh, And that's the mystery. Why is the third floor have uh, patients who seem to get better faster and be healed more uh, more, uh, evidently? Well, uh, it's kind of a mystery that uh, was was unsolved for a long time. Uh, Why is it that the third floor uh, was uh, was different? And uh, it started to come out in... um, the patient surveys. There was a patient survey that every patient got on the way out of the care, and uh, on the patient surveys, they would, uh, the patients on the third floor would rate their experience higher, and in the comments section, they would uh, bring up the name of a man named Walter. The uh, hospital had four floors and had a different custodian on every floor. The custodian on the third floor was named Walter. And uh, if you were to ask the other three custodians uh, there in the hospital, uh, they wouldn't say they hated their job. They would just say that their job was low level, low importance, meaningless really, just pushing the broom and uh, mopping the floors and emptying the waste baskets. But if you talk to Walter, Walter would say, oh no, my job is God's calling. It's my purpose. And that's why Walter was going to his supervisor and talking about the paint in the walls in the patient's rooms and saying, why are all the patient rooms the same gray, drab color? And why are there no pictures on the wall? And the supervisor said, Walter, if you want to change the paint color and you want to change uh, the look of the rooms, you're going to have to go to the hospital board. And so Walter did. Walter went to the uh, hospital board, and they were so impressed with his presentation that they gave him money for improvement uh, to allow him to buy paint and put up pictures on his own time. And so while Walter was putting up these uh, pictures and painting the walls, people would ask him, why are you doing this, Walter? And he would say, well, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but God has put me here to do whatever I can do. And Walter did more than just paint and put up pictures. Because his job took him into every patient room. And while he was mopping the floor in the patient's room or emptying the wastebasket, he would introduce himself, and then he would say to the uh, patient lying in the hospital bed, "Uh, you see this uh, picture of the sunrise over the mountain? I'm praying this for you. I'm praying that you understand that this is a brand new day of God's love and care for you. And by the way, I know that this is a sunrise and not a sunset because I bought this picture and I put it up with you in mind. God bless you. And Walter would do that in every patient room. Go to a different one of the pictures that he had put up and apply it to the patient and these patients got the message. Why would Walter do that? Well, it's because he had this extraordinary purpose for his, what seemed like an ordinary job. He had this extraordinary God-given purpose for what seemed like an ordinary job, and it was a message that came to his patients who would write down in the comment section of their patient survey something about Walter, which solved the mystery of the third floor. The third floor miracle was a man with God-given purpose in his job named Walter. Whatever I do, whatever I work at, wherever I work, I can be like Walter. Maybe I work in an office, or uh, I'm a student uh, going to school, or maybe I'm a retired or between jobs. Whatever my work is, Walter proves that the impact of my life is not found in working, but in God's purpose in my work. 
Over and over again in Scripture, God proclaims that his people have a purpose. There, there is no such thing as a meaningless job. Over and over, Scripture declares that wherever God's people work, they have an extraordinary purpose in what seems like an ordinary job. Uh, for instance, uh, as God says through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Now, in the context of these words, Paul says, if you're single, God has a purpose for your singleness. If you're married, God has a purpose for your marriage. But then, in the very same context, Paul moves from marital status to employment, to work. And he says, whether you're slave or free, have a high position job or low position job, your work is alive with purpose if you are in Christ. Your purpose for your job goes beyond your paycheck. God has an extraordinary purpose through what seems like your ordinary job. Now, this is not just theoretical. God really does have a purpose for your work. And we see it in person after person, uh, like people like Walter. Or, for instance, I could tell you about people like Dan and Joe and Becky and Esther. Dan worked for the government. Uh, Joe worked in a correctional facility. Uh, Becky worked with uh, water and wells. And uh, Esther, well, let me start with her because as some of you have already figured out, Dan and Joe and Becky and Esther are Old Testament characters. Uh, Esther was a young woman who followed God when God's people were vulnerable exiles in a strange land. Esther was forced to serve the, in the king's palace where God kept elevating her because of her character and, uh, in ways until she became queen of the entire nation. Did God have a purpose for Esther's work? Absolutely, because God's people were about to become victims of a massacre, and Esther was the only person who could intervene with the king, which sounds like it would be easy, but it was the opposite of easy. It was so risky that Esther could have been killed in the process of intervening for God's people. But Esther received this encouraging word. Esther, who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Esther rightly understood that this was God, that God had put her in her position for a purpose. God placed her in her work so that she could save people God loved. And this week, I'm gonna ask you to look around, look around where you work with the people you go to school with, or the people you uh, spend time with, uh, you volunteer with, or people in your office. Like Esther, people, God has placed people who need to be part of his blessing, who uh, in order for you to be a part of saving these people, God has put you where you are with a purpose, with your testimony, your relationship with Jesus, with the message of the salvation that comes only in Jesus. I'm not saying it's all up to you to save the people around you. No, not at all. Uh, salvation is God's story in the people uh, and their lives around us. God does the saving. But if we're willing to be courageous like Esther, we have the privilege of being partners in his purpose of saving people. So look around you, and maybe, just maybe, God's saving purpose is in play with the person who works with you. Or maybe like Dan, it's with your boss. Like Esther, Daniel uh, was a forced labor exile uh, except Daniel was placed in Babylon's accelerated management training program. And when the training was over, Daniel was presented to King Nebuchadnezzar, and scripture says that uh, when the king saw Daniel and saw how Daniel worked, he saw how Daniel was 10 
times better than any of his other employees. So Daniel became one of many of the king's advisors, this tyrant king who was deeply troubled with nightmares. Uh, the king told his advisors that he wanted his nightmare interpreted. But here's the kicker. He was not going to tell them what the dream was. Uh, and the king also declared to his advisors that they had better guess his dream correctly because if they did not, they would be executed. See, Nebuchadnezzar was a tough boss. When he terminated an employee, he really terminated an employee. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so when these other advisors were cowering in fear, Daniel courageously recounted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and explain what it meant. And sensing that he was uh, in God's presence through Daniel, Daniel's tough boss fell on his face and acknowledged God. And it was the beginning of a really amazing spiritual journey uh, for King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Then there's the book of Nehemiah, uh, which is uh, all about Nehemiah, who was the king's cupbearer. He was the cupbearer for the king of Persia. Uh, back then, the cupbearer for the king was like being the head of uh, the secret service for the president of the United States. It meant being a trusted friend and confidant to the most powerful man in the world. Well, with the same courage displayed by Esther and Daniel, Nehemiah uh, boldly requested that the king release him so that he could serve God and God's purpose by rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem's walls were in ruin, God uh, had people he loved who were under terrible uh, suffering and sickness and attack. And maybe God has put you where you work for the same reason that God put Nehemiah in his job. This week, look around at the people you work with or study with or uh, you spend your time with. Look around, and is there someone whose life is falling apart? Is there someone whose world is crumbling and just needs a friend who will listen and care enough to help them rebuild in their lives? It might be that God has called you to be Nehemiah, to be a rebuilder for someone he loves around you who is broken. Maybe God has called you, just like Walter, to be a part of the healing process. God has called you not just to push a broom or push a mop or push papers or push a product. God has called you there to push God's healing into places of hurt, to push God's presence into places of pain, to push God's love in places of loneliness and despair. And then there's Joseph who I mentioned earlier in this Faith at Work series, Joe landed in a correctional facility uh, because he was falsely accused of a crime. But that was all part of God's plan to raise Joseph from being Pharaoh's prisoner to being Pharaoh's vice president, a job God gave to Joseph so that Joseph could be a channel of God's blessing to his family, starting with his family, and then a channel of blessing to, no kidding, the whole known world at that time. So in Esther and Daniel and Joseph and Nehemiah, God keeps showing me that God's purpose for my work includes using me to bring salvation and healing and blessing to people he loves. Scripture keeps coming back to this as one of God's main purposes for my work. Therefore, I need to open my eyes. I need to open my eyes. I need to intentionally be looking around me at my workplace, at my school, at my home, or in my neighborhood, or wherever it is I do my work. I must open my eyes to see God's purpose for my work in bringing salvation and healing and blessing to people he loves. But this is not God's only purpose. God also shows me his second 
key purpose for my work through Becky or Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24. The story begins with Abraham. God uh, promised Abraham that he would become the father of a nation, a nation that would bless all the nations on earth. So uh, Abraham had a son named Isaac who was going to be a a next channel in that uh, family blessing to the whole world. And he needed to get married. So Abraham sent out his friend Eliezer uh, with 10 camels to go looking for God's choice for Isaac's wife. And after traveling miles and miles and miles in the dusty desert, Eliezer came within sight of a spring with a well. And many young women from the village were coming to the well with their jars. That was their job in those days. And Eliezer prayed, God, if your choice for Isaac's wife is among all these women, uh, have her come to me and say, I will give you a drink and I will also give a drink to your camels. Now, this camel thing is a very big deal because one camel could drink 30 gallons of water. So 10 camels, we're talking 300 gallons of water. That's a whole lot of well water. But sure enough, uh, as uh, Eliezer was scanning this scene, one, one, one woman had the love and care and courage to approach this thirsty visitor to the village. And when Eliezer asked her for a drink, Rebecca said, not only will I give you a drink, but I will give you water enough for all of your camels. Rebecca had the same job, the same seemingly ordinary job as all the other young women, but she had an extraordinary purpose just like Walter. Rebecca had this elevated sense of purpose. Rebecca understood her purpose was not just drawing water. Rebecca had this God-given sense of purpose that her purpose was serving thirsty people. Rebecca understood that her God-given purpose was quenching thirst for one person or even one camel at a time. There's something God taught Rebecca on the job. And through Rebecca, I see how God's purpose for my work includes growing me through the job into the kind of person he can use for his purpose. God used Rebecca to, uh, to grow her through her job into the kind of person who could be a matriarch of God's people, a mom to millions, a mom with a purpose, a purpose to be a part of God's planned blessing for millions throughout history as she became the great, great, great grandmom of Jesus who called himself the living water who quenches eternal thirst. God has extraordinary purpose in what seems like your ordinary work. God wants to use my job to transform others, but God also wants to use my job to transform me. God wants to use my work to be a blessing to others, but God also wants to use my work to shower blessing on me to make me a blessing in this world. God has a purpose for my work whether I get a paycheck or if I'm a student or I'm retired or I'm a mom on a mission like Maria Fay. I try to think of our house like the church. The church is um, it's where God dwells and it's where his people grow in him, but it also welcomes anyone. And I want my house to be like that. I want it to be where we grow, but I also want it to be where other people feel welcomed. If it's interns living with us, a random lady from Rwanda stuck here during COVID living with us for six months, um, people in trouble needing a place to stay, our global partners needing a place to stay, um, our kids' friends needing a place to be on the days there's no school and their parents still have to work. 
I try to look at it as this is God's house and what would he want me to do with it. Hi, I'm Maria Fay. I'm a Christ follower and I've been going to Black Rock for 23 years and I'm a mom. If you would have asked me at 6, 16, or even 20 what I wanted to be when I grow up, I always said a mom. But you can't get a degree in being a mom. So I went the business, marketing, and management route. And I got a great job. Cushy, paid well, great benefits. Um, but it was just to pay the bills so that I could be a mom. Eli came first. A few years before we were planning to start kids, while Josh was still in grad school, um, and then under two years, we had Zoe. Under two years, we had Ian. And just a little over two years, we had Ava and Ivy. So by the age of 30, I had five kids. I think one of the biggest impacts you can have for Christ is impacting a life. And um, the younger they are, the more open they are. A typical day in the Faye family house is everybody's up and all you know, their things are gathered for sports for after school and their book bags for school and it's breakfast and it's getting everybody to the bus or to school and then it's um, quick to the grocery store and clean a few things around the house and pick up and do a couple loads of laundry and start up dinner and then it's going around and picking up kids and dropping them off to various different sports, making sure homework gets done and trying to make time for family dinner even if it's at somebody's sporting event or at home, and we say our highs and lows, and we talk about our days, and then hopefully everybody in bed at a decent time. I'm very organized, and that helps, and I feel like all my God-given gifts really are being used when it comes to just everyday life and raising a large family. So when the kids were little, I didn't make time to be in the Word, and I used five little kids as an excuse. Um, and in time, you notice that you're not enjoying them as much as I once was. I wasn't enjoying doing load and load after laundry and changing diaper after diaper. And when I got back into being in the Word, I found that joy again. One of our great joys we've had as a family, as I said earlier, has been opening our home to anyone in need. I think one of our favorite memories is a young girl who came and lived with us that was lost in college and was new to the faith, didn't really know what a Christ-centered home looked like. Um, and just being able to invite her into our home and our lives and our family for a year and seeing her now um, just flourish in a church, in a relationship that's glorifying the Lord, the family of her own, and it's just a beautiful thing. In today's world, I feel like the family is being pulled apart and everybody's going in their own direction, and that's something that we've tried really hard to um, make a point of having our family together as much as possible. One of our favorite family traditions is saying our highs and lows at dinner. It started when the kids were little um, and we continued it till this day and it's your favorite part of the day and your least favorite part of the day and the point was, and I think I grabbed it from some book, was just to get your kids to open up. They'll always tell you the great things of their day but sometimes you won't know that somebody was making fun of them at school or they were embarrassed about something. And it's really helped us just kind of see where they are and um, given us a safe place to share and help me know where to pray for them. Um, as they get older and you have health issues, you realize there's a lot of things out of your control. Um, you can love your kids so much, but your kids are diagnosed with a disease that has no cure. You have two options. It's to push God away or pull God in. And I've seen too many people push God away and their lives fall apart. So I found that pulling him in and that means screaming to him and begging him by just reaching out to him 
is the best thing you can do for yourself and for your kids and as a mom. First Corinthians talks about how we should live as a believer in whatever job or situation the Lord has called us to. And I believe that as a mom, that's one of the most important things you can do is just live as a believer. And um, it's a job that's 365, 24-7, doesn't come with perks or benefits. In a lot of ways, you don't get a 401k, you don't get a paycheck at the end of the week to show you what you're worth. But know that God has you there for a reason and for a purpose and that you are making a difference in the kingdom of God. You know, I hope if you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, grandmom or granddad, I hope you know just how extraordinary your purpose is in what seems like an ordinary job. I love how Maria uh, is a mom on a mission, and she starts with her purpose statement that the church is God's house, where God both grows his children and also welcomes anyone in need, and so Maria's purpose is to make her home, God's house, where he grows uh, his children and also welcomes those who are lost and hurting, and one of Maria's favorite Family memories is how they opened their home to a uh, non-family member, uh, how they made room for over a year to a, a college woman who was from a broken home, had nowhere else to go. And I know this, uh, this woman and uh, how the, uh, living in God's house with the phase, I know how it changed her life and how she now uh, faithfully serves here in the Black Rock Church family because of all the healing that she received, freely received in the Fay House and freely shares with uh, others now. I think we uh, all look at Maria's mom with a mission, kind of God-given purpose, and we admire how she makes her life count. We admire uh, the Esthers and the Nehemiahs and the Daniels and the Josephs and the Rebecca's we admire them, but then we stop with admiration, and we don't actually go beyond to actually living with this kind of God-given purpose that gives our life impact and makes our lives really count in similar ways. And I think I know why we stop short with just admiration. We fail to live with God's purpose in our work because we fail to adopt the success secret that is common to Esther and Daniel and Nehemiah and Joseph and Rebecca. The success secret for purpose at work is faith over fear. Uh, Esther fulfilled her purpose to save people God loved because she had faith in God over fear of the king. Uh, Daniel was reaching his unreachable boss because he chose faith over fear. Nehemiah repaired broken walls and broken people by choosing faith over fear. Rebecca was the only one who gave water to Eleazar because she chose faith over fear. And Maria demonstrates the same impact when we choose faith over fear. The matter of overcoming fear is so important that Jesus calls each and every one of his followers to something called baptism. Uh, Jesus calls every one of his followers to overcome their fear and publicly declare faith, faith in him through baptism. Jesus knows that if we do not choose to defeat fear by standing with him in front of believers, then I will never stand alone with him and my God-given purpose at school or at work or in my neighborhood or even in my home. The only way I can fulfill God's purpose is if I choose faith over fear. So if you have not been baptized as a believer, then follow Jesus' call and be baptized in one of the three morning services on November 20th. And I'll bring this slide back 
uh, at the very end so that you can uh, scan the QR code and, uh, or you can go right to the baptism booth uh, today if you're here uh, and you can sign up uh, online as well. Also, on your way out, you'll be offered one of these uh, business cards uh, just to remind you to remember, reflect, and respond to God's word today. Remember, God has a purpose for my work that goes beyond my paycheck. And then also, this week, reflect. Where does God see purpose in my work that maybe I'm not seeing right now? And then respond. I'll ask God to open my eyes this week to his purpose in the lives of people, the purpose in my work, so that I can, I can actually act on this idea of God having an extraordinary purpose in my sometimes seemingly ordinary job. This week, say, Jesus, open my eyes to what you're doing in the lives of people I work with, go to school with, uh, I spend time with, Use me to bring your salvation, your healing, your blessing to the people you love. But Jesus, I know that you not only want to transform people in my job, you want to transform me. So please use my work to grow me into the kind of person that you can use for your extraordinary purpose. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that uh, when you come uh, into our lives, as we put our faith in you, uh, as you uh, take over what is um, our lives that are without real eternal purpose, that when you come into our lives, you give us an extraordinary eternal purpose for our work. So Lord, we pray that as we uh, even now uh, think about our, our lives, our daily lives, what our work is. Give us a vision. Give us a vision of how you can use our work as we choose faith over fear. Lord, would you just fill us again with the, the, the uh, clear choice that in order for our lives to have impact, it's not just working, it's working with your purposes in mind. So Lord, fill us again with faith over fear, with your vision, we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen, and please stand as we sing together. The third verse of the song we're about to sing begins, Riches I heed not, or man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. So just before we sing, I want to give you a moment to reflect, to bow your head before God, and ask him to renew his purpose in you, in your work, in your home.
So God's placed before us uh, a, a vision, a vision, and we can either just look at the, the people of uh, Scripture, uh, like Esther and Rebecca and Nehemiah and Joseph and Daniel. We can look at the people like Walter and Maria, and we can just admire them, or we can decide that we are going to be those people who work on purpose, who work with God-given purpose that makes our, our lives full of extraordinary purpose, even when it comes to what seems like ordinary jobs. That's our choice to do that, but it means that we need to make a choice of faith over fear. And uh, a good place to start with that is baptism. So I leave this up here. Uh, you can use the uh, code to scan it, and uh, you can electronically just register to be baptized on uh, November 20th, or head out to the baptism booth. Just sign up, and we'll get you on your way uh, to be baptized on November 20th in one of our three services. And now may you go with extraordinary purpose given to you by Jesus who calls you to follow him and make an eternal impact in his name. Amen.